morning. Um, I am Autumn Neighbors, Director of Curriculum Instruction in Richmond Public Schools, and I'm honored to welcome you each to the second annual RPS Capstone Showcase. Our theme this year is Young Minds, Pathways to Real Change. And on behalf of the RPS leadership team, I thank you for joining us to showcase the hard work our students who have collaborated with adults in our community and in our schools to understand real world issues and form real solutions. This showcase is a key benchmark for students to show their learning from our two key courses, Policy Pathways and Real Richmond, and using their voice to be advocates for change. Just earlier this week, former First Lady Michelle Obama spoke to our Richmond community. I'm still, I'm still moved by, the, <laughs> by her words. And she reminded scholars that you don't have to do it all to change the world. Each small action can bring great impact. I'm excited to see and hear how our students will make their impact this morning. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lucas, the president and CEO of Policy Pathways. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Neighbors, for that beautiful welcome and for getting us started to a wonderful day today. As Dr. Neighbors stated, my name is Dr. D. Pulani Lucas, and I am President and CEO of Policy Pathways Incorporated. We are honored to have with us today our special guests, keynote speaker, the Honorable Tremel Howard, Delegate Dolores L. McQuinn, Dr. Shonda M. Harris Muhammad, and RPS administrators and staff, distinguished guests, students, family members, colleagues, and friends. On behalf of the Policy Pathways Board of Directors and Administrative st Staff, I would like to thank you so much for joining us this morning. Policy Pathways is honored to partner with Richmond Public Schools in the provision of equitable access to high quality policy education in high schools. Through our Policy and Society College Preparatory Program, Policy Pathways provides a college prep curriculum to college-bound and non-college-bound high school students. Our curriculum covers five core areas of study, critical thinking, policy formation, policy analysis, advocacy and persuasion, and the capstone project. This semester, our curriculum covered topics such as radical self-care, the power of youth activism, policy formation, research methods, social equity in public policy, immigration policy, energy policy in Ghana, economics, trans justice and LGBTQ rights, and more. Our course content was delivered not only by outstanding RPS teachers, but also by an internationally diverse teaching staff that came from across the United States and around the world. Our curriculum aligns with the Virginia SOL assessments and aims to build five skill areas that the Virginia Department of Education expects of high school graduates. That is, those are critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, communication, and citizenship. In public policy, the policy-making process begins with a problem. Students in the Shaping Our Future Policy Pathways courses will do just that. They will start their presentations off 
with a problem statement and then move forward through the policy making process as they discuss real world policy issues and problems. I would like to thank Superintendent Jason Cameras, Dr. Tracy Epp, Ms. Candice Vini Chaplin, Mr. Masiahu Israel, and the Shaping Our Future Policy Pathways and Real Richmond Teachers, Dr. Mylandra Coleman, Mr. Darian Sneed, Ms. Caitlin Sitlarchik, Mr. Chad Ingo, and Mr. John Conroy. And we have to give a major shout out to our awesome students in the Policy Pathways and Real Richmond courses for an outstanding job this semester. We look forward to hearing from you and learning about what you have learned this term. Our sincere <clears throat> appreciation goes out to our Capstone site partners, Marijuana Justice, Chelsea Higgs Wise, and Evan Smith, the Author Ash Oral History Project at UCLA, where the students worked with Chaniri and Wanye and Mr. Knox Toll and the Virginia Interscholastic Association Heritage Association, and also Dr. Nazira Bolotsky of UCLA. We also want to thank our amazing lecturers and guest speakers who helped to make this semester a success. Policy Pathways is grateful for your partnership and for your commitment to RPS students. We also thank Julie Bezent. Bazinski for her outstanding graphic design work. So now I would like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Shonda M. Harris Mohammed. She is a 30 year educator who serves as the Richmond School Board Chair and represents the 6th District. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Awesome. First of all, congratulations on a job well done. I am so excited for you on behalf of the members of the Richmond School Board and actually the entire school division. Congratulations. I know that this was a lot of work, dedicated work, a lot of time. Um, and so you chose to dedicate yourselves to this arena of policy pathways and to work with real Richmond teachers. To those two entities, thank you as well for working, working with our students and working for our students. Young people, three things that I want you to remember as you matriculate through your high school career. There are three things that I want you to always keep with you and ponder over. Understanding what requires change. As a part of this program, you probably discuss that. Change, change, change. There are three, there are two constant things, change and change. I also want you to remember what is your passion? The time is now to identify that. Start small with your desires. That's number three. Former First Lady Michelle Obama spoke to that earlier this week. It's the small things. You don't have to take a big chunk of what you see in the world that needs to be addressed and what needs to be changed. But first and, and lastly, lastly, always remember this, who you are and what you were built here to do. Richmond Public Schools is so proud of you and the work that you have done. And I know some of your teachers personally and they are not easy to impress. You made it this far. So you have done a great work in yourself and the work that you've done will impact our city of Richmond and your peers. So again, thank you, congratulations, and I look forward to your presentations. Thank you, Dr. Lucas. Very good. And next up, we have Mr. J. Austin Brown. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be a part of the Policy Pathways and Real Richmond Capstone Showcase and to introduce today's guest speaker. I also extend regrets on behalf of Superintendent Cameras, who's unable to be with us this morning. He's going to miss out on a opportunity this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker is an educator, community advocate, and a believer in the urgent need to advance equity in all of its forms across every context. Like many of us, our speaker was raised by a single mother who, despite never going to college, embodied and demonstrated the transformative power of hard work and commitment, working multiple jobs to ensure the family had what it needed. Similarly, his maternal grandfather, who attended school only until the ninth grade, instilled in this dynamic young man and his siblings an unyielding belief that education can change and save lives. He credits that commitment to education for saving his life, helping to lift him and his siblings out of poverty and helping them to build successful careers. A native of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, this dynamic young man became the youngest person ever elected to the East Baton Rouge School Board in 2018. Shortly after taking office, he was installed by his fellow members as vice president of the board. As vice president, he has been a champion for disadvantaged students and led the charge for the creation and adoption of the board's first charter school accountability policy. He has also been a champion for diversifying the teaching force and making resources, resource equitable a priority. Just like many educators here today, our speaker began his professional journey in a classroom. He was an eighth grade history teacher with Teach for America. It was while working in the Law Center's student family clinic, family clinic that his vision for the work he does today was shaped. At that time, his clients, clients were largely children of color facing financial hardships and trauma. He saw in the faces and spirits of those young people, the potential of hope amidst deprivation and struggle. He also heard the calling to do more. He heard the ringing of a bell. Our speaker is currently the Louisiana External Relations and, um, and Policy Manager for Education Trust, a national nonprofit that works to close the opportunity gap that disproportionately affects students of color. Here's something about our speaker that's not in his resume that I know. His nickname is T Mail, and his special talent is he plays the trumpet and the baritone. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure and enthusiasm that I introduce our keynote speaker for today's program, Dr. Tramel Howard. Please give him a warm Richmond Public Schools welcome, Dr. Howard. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mr. Brown. Um, and I thank you for doing that research. Uh, I didn't expect to hear my nickname um, in the middle of this conversation. 
But it is indeed my pleasure to be with you guys today, and I look forward to uh, hearing more from the students as they create uh, this policy change. Um, it's an honor to be uh, from Louisiana. I be greet bring greetings from Louisiana and the Education Trust here in Louisiana. So um, I'll just get started by saying good morning. As they stated, I'm Tramel Howard, a native of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I'm delighted to speak with you guys today. I currently serve as the State Director for the Education Trust, a national nonprofit that advocates on behalf of students of color and students from low-income backgrounds. I also serve as an East Baton Rouge Parish School Board member for District 3. I was born to a single teenage mother. Much of my life is owed to my mom and grandparents who sacrificed so much for me to be sitting here before you today as a lawyer, young as elected official, Amazon best-selling author, founder of an organization, and most of all, a forever teacher. I was honored when I received a call about speaking to young people who are looking to change the world through policy. We're living in a time where words alone are not enough. We're living in a time where action is necessary to create true change. Just a couple of weeks ago, we lost many beautiful souls to senseless gun violence, something that common sense policy could have prevented. Young people, your time is now, and we are depending on you to help us reach our full potential. Families, in order for them to be the true change, agents that I know they can be, you're gonna to have to continue to be their village. It truly takes a village. Moms, grandmas, cousins, teachers, school leaders, aunties, uncles, support these young people as they navigate this thing called life. Continue to provide platforms for them to be seen, heard, and acknowledged. The world needs more, them more now than ever. I'm gonna be very short to get today because you guys have worked so hard for this moment and I can't wait to see how you really are ready to change the world through policy. Barack Obama, Beyonce Knowles, Kamala Harris, Oprah Winfrey, Passion Terry, Duntrell Jones, Heaven Smith. Each of them have something in common. They've invested in themselves. Young people, now more than ever, you have to take some time to invest in yourself. The easiest way to do that is to start with education. Education was my way out. I was raised in Scotlandville, Louisiana, located in North Baton Rouge, a primarily low-income community. My mom worked three jobs. My father was in and out of prison, and I saw young men get shot and killed right outside my house. I have a cousin that's serving a life sentence for murder, but I couldn't let these things affect my self-investment. Education was my only way out, so I took it very serious. I was a first-generation college student, and the first person in my family to go to law school and graduate from law school. You might ask, how do I get to self-investment self with all of this? There are three Ps that I like to live by. The first P is perseverance. Perseverance. Your dreams should be so big that they scare you. A famous philosopher by the name of Kevin Gates once said, a vision without action is merely a dream. You have to work hard, and sometimes everything is not going to happen when you want it to happen. Keep working. Learn from your failures and know that failures are not final. Pick yourself up. You may make a wrong turn, but just like the GPS, reroute yourself and get back on track. The second P is people. Be careful of the people you surround yourself with. There are two types of people in the world, a person who lifts you up or a person who brings you down. If every conversation is about who's sliding in your DMs and who's dating who, they don't mean you any good. Surround yourself with people that support you and encourage you to follow your dreams. Also surround yourself with people that challenge you to be better and more. If you're the, far, if you're the smartest person in your circle, find a new one. The third and final P is polite. We have to get back to respecting each other and being polite. Love your brother and sister. You never know who can help you reach your goals in life. We as a collective society no longer value life. If you look around us, our country is crying out for help. We're literally living in a nation where we have lost the core principle of treating people the way we want to be treated. Let's get back to that. As you go on in life, remember that every decision has a consequence. Be mindful of the decisions you are making because a consequence or consequences are sure to follow, good or bad. I was once a teacher and I think about my former students. Many of them made great decisions that have led to some rewarding consequences 
And some of them have made decisions that have completely altered their lives and not for the better. Young people, as you continue on this thing called life, be mindful of the decisions you make because, because consequences are sure to follow. You can do anything you put your mind to. Never let anyone tell you different. Be the author of your own story. Young people, you are well on your way to doing the things that will forever change the world. Keep at it. Don't give up. Failures are not final. And remember, every day above ground is a day to create the forever change that you desire. Thank you so much, Richard, for having me today. And I look forward to witnessing, witnessing you change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tramiel Howard. That was inspirational. Thank you. We will now turn the microphone over to Mr. Masiahu Israel. Good morning, can you hear me well? Yes, um, you can turn your volume up a little. Okay, let me see. I might have to change up what I'm doing here. I wanna make sure. I'm Am I any better? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this is such a wonderful moment. I'm watching my time making sure that we are running according to schedule. Uh, briefly, uh, I just want to tell you about the Capstone Day and how this came to be. Dr. Lucas uh, was a partner of mine since the Policy Pathways course was introduced to Richmond Public Schools. It came in around the same time as the Real Richmond course had been finished, and we piloted both classes in the previous year virtually that we weren't uh, quite prepared to do virtually in the beginning, thinking that we would come back in person. Um, and, and so I looked at the Policy Pathways uh, course. Uh, I saw what it was providing for students with regard to their research. And Real Richmond is rooted in that same kind of desire for students to research, uh, to use historical thinking and skills. And so um, I looked at the, the rubric, I looked at what they were doing for their project and said, how can we use some of what they're doing in policy pathways to uh, inspire some of the research process uh, for Real Richmond? And so from collaboration with, uh, between myself and, and, and Dr. Lucas, we uh, decided that the Capstone Day would not just be for uh, policy pathways, but we also wanted to introduce our real Richmond students to this opportunity as well. Now, one of the differences is that the real Richmond course uh, being new and was created right here in the city of Richmond uh, by teachers who put pen to paper, by scholars and historical locations who gave us information and resources, um, we decided that we wanted the presentations and the research for students to be wide ranging. So you'll notice for the Real Richmond course, students can really do research on anything that they desire to do research on, but we want them to think about their city. And we want them to think about the impact that their um, research will have on the city of Richmond. Uh, just to show you a little bit real quick, I'm gonna take over the screen here. And if you can see, this is the uh, RPS History uh, website, uh, called Grow History. And when you come here, it's Grow History RPS. And when you come over to um, uh, this side here, you'll see where it says Real Richmond History. And I just want to show you that real quick. You see our beautiful uh, <laughs> uh, background of our city. But we have an overview of the course for those who want to know a little bit more about the Real Richmond History course, the text that we use. What's important here to understand for the real Richmond portion of the capstone is that students have been studying their history and themes uh, all year. So these are the theme buckets. And then instead of trying to go wider, we go deeper so that students understand uh, these themes. Understanding the impact that ideas um, and actions and forces such as racism and justice are having on all of these themes and, and understanding that where there is oppression, there's also a fight for justice and for freedom. And so as we uh, continue down 
uh, you'll see here for the capstone projects for the Real Richmond course, which are designed very similarly to those of the Policy Pathways course, that they're a final culmination uh, in the form of a rubric-based presentation, right? Uh, the capstone projects are completed and can be completed for Real Richmond in the following formats, right? We allow students to be able to do old school paper if they desire. Uh, we'd love for them to introduce video and do video and podcasting. Uh, we also allow them the opportunity to express through artwork, through the curation of a collection of historical traces, many museums, etc. And of course, what you're going to see today is just a final presentation in slide form of a larger project that they did for the course. Uh, some of the requirements, the performances, um, Visual projects require a process paper, um, unless they did a research paper. They need releases for their oral histories and photographs, um, references throughout their paper. And, and the key here is that they must locate and incorporate a geographical space in Richmond relevant to the research. So all of the research for Real Richmond will be focused somewhere in the city of Richmond. But I wanted to share that uh, with you because I want you to understand that Policy Pathways as a course is powerful because what it is doing on that side of the capstone project is allowing students to have an opportunity to think about the change of policy in the United States and the world. And having uh, worked with uh, folks all the way as far away as Ghana, our students in Policy Pathways have had continued access to scholars, to, um, to those who work in law, those who are actually policy makers and changers. And so these two courses are really providing students an awesome opportunity for networking and access, right? So as these courses are <clears throat> newer to, uh, to the Richmond uh, course system, we continue to, to grow and develop based upon the experiences that we've had with these courses. I think that we will see that over time, as we continue to use what we've learned from policy pathways and what we um, have learned from, uh, you know, the real Richmond course, that uh, our students will continue to build that muscle memory and that ability to, uh, to research, to use historical skill and analysis to actually work to solve some of the great problems that exist in our society. I'm so excited uh, to have our students with us today. So excited that they have taken that step to come forward to be a part of this. I mean, this is not a small thing. And I know everybody understands that that for you to, to step forward and say, I wanna present my work and my research, that which is near to me, and I wanna present it to the world. I think it's just so beautiful that we have students moving in this direction. And I really wanna credit Dr. Lucas and Policy Pathways and that course for inspiring this capstone day and for allowing our real Richmond students and teachers to partner with you all to be a part of this day. So as you are in the audience, and as you are uh, waiting so, so wonderfully with, with that support and love to see our students uh, and what they've produced, uh, just know that the best is still yet to come. Each and every day, each and every year, our students will continue to do more, to learn more, to be more, and to improve not only our city, but the world at large. And I yield the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Israel. Our courses are sister courses, and it has been a pleasure working with you. Thank you for that summary. It was beautifully done. Now is the time for you to experience what the students have learned and to be inspired. I am now going to share my screen. And what we have, we have combined all of the student presentations into one slideshow. So um, each RPS teacher will introduce their students or student 
and tell us a little bit about what they've experienced this term. And then the students will turn, uh, they'll turn it over to the students to present. And um, you have each class should have their run of show. So you know the order that you will present in, okay? So first up, we have Mr. Darian Sneed. Okay, good morning. Uh, and uh, Dr. Pilate, again, uh, thank you. I, I am here with the Armstrong team uh, coming to you from the East End and the oldest comprehensive high school in the city. Um, I have the department head here, Mr. Stern, who uh, has been very interested in what we're doing over here and also have been extremely supportive because I was out a couple of days and uh, he's been made himself available to the students. So I'm, I'm glad he's here. Also, Mr. Scott, who's the government teacher here, who also was able to lend some advisement as we moved on. This team consisted of uh, some young ladies primarily who are uh, we met with some opposition at first, and I, I thank Dr. Pulani again because she was able to motivate these young ladies to kind of get after it. And uh, I'm extremely proud of the job they did and how they represented us. I have with me Ms. Michaela. Can we see you, Ms. Michaela? You don't want to wave and be seen. Thank you. And I have Ms. Passion, Ms. Nasia, and Ms. Cherish. And so I'm going to yield to the floor and let these ladies get down. Um, they're ready for the day, and uh, I know they're going to do a good job. Come on, Ms. McKenna. Okay. Can you guys hear me fine? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. You remember that? No. <laughs> you learn? Take a deep yeah, breath. Yeah, Take a deep breath. Okay. I put it there. Okay. Welcome everyone. My name is Michaela Leitner. Our capstone project is titled The Legalization of Marijuana in Virginia and the Reduction of Penalties for Cannabis Related Offenses Among Minors. The capstone team members are myself, Michaela. Cherish, Nina, Nasia, and Passion. We are all in the ninth, 10th, and 11th grade. We are students at Armstrong High School. Our teacher name is Mr. Darren Sneed. Our capstone site is Marijuana Justice. We worked with our capstone site representative, Mr. Evan Smith. Our problem statement is that marijuana use, legalization, and Punishment negatively affects the lives of minors. Some young people smoke marijuana when they see other people using it. They think it's okay for them to do the same, but marijuana consumption by youth can negatively affect on their body and brain development. In Virginia, young people who are under 18 years old and found possession or using marijuana are most impacted by marijuana offenses and their parents and guardians might also be impacted. Hi, my name is Cherish. Research shows that in, that in people under, under 18 years of age, marijuana dis disrupts brain systems by affecting memory and the ability to learn. Marijuana also causes anxiety and alters judgment and motor skills. When we are discussing the effects of marijuana on people, our age in class one day, my classmate Passion said that she feels like smoking marijuana is bad for all people, but mostly kids our age because it messes up your lungs and causes other health issues. As with tobacco smoke, marijuana smoke is toxic and can harm the lungs. 
someone who smokes marijuana regularly may have many of the same breathing and lung problems that tobacco smokers do, such as a daily cough and a greater risk of lung infection like pneumonia. My name is Nasia. For policy formation, we focused on the role of cannabis legalization and penalties. On July 1st, 2021, Senate Bill 1406 became law in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Adults who are 21 years old or over can possess and use marijuana recreationally within specific limits. Code of Virginia Section 4.1-1105.1 furnishes the penalty for under, uh, underage possession or use of marijuana. Virginia Code 1-207 defines a minor as a child, juvenile, minor, or infant, or any combination thereof meaning a person less than 18 years of age. In class, we discuss how legislation and punishment are designed to modify behavior and benefit society. Harsher cannabis, Harsher cannabis penalties for people under 18 years old aim to punish and modify their behaviors but legalization and punishment are not always effective for everyone. The social inequities and punishment are a real concern for the students of my class. During this semester, we discussed the unequal impact marijuana penalties have on people under 18 years old. Minors with a marijuana offense may be fined, required to enter a substance abuse program or treated like a juvenile delinquent and subjected to additional punishments. Under Virginia law, Minors can be put on probation, have the driver's license suspended, be fined up to $500, have parents required to participate in a substance abuse program, and even custody taken away from parents or guardians. Minors are most impacted by the criminalization of marijuana use. This has long-term impact on those who have been convicted. Hi, my name is Passion. With the loosening of marijuana legislation in states like Virginia for people 21 years of old and above, there is concern that the presence of cannabis dispensaries and highly visible advertisements and images can appeal to children and young people. Some THC product packaging can appeal to young people who might find it hard to distinguish distinguish these items from non-THC products. THC is the chemical in marijuana that is responsible for its psychological effects. The table shows the outcomes of several studies that examine youth marijuana use after the passage of laws allowing adults to use marijuana. Outcomes reveal that there is still debate around, around whether youth marijuana is use is increasing, remaining unchanged or decreasing after a dark marijuana laws are loosened. Do I have to read his part too? For our policy analyst, analyst section, we looked at data from the Virginia Department of Health in 2015. The Virginia Department of Health surveyed 195,000 Virginia high school students about their substance use in the Virginia Youth Survey. Research shows that drug abuse begins in adolescence and young adulthood. When young people begin trying alcohol, tobacco, and illegal and prescription drugs, young people most frequently abuse alcohol followed by marijuana and tobacco. Repeated substance use can result in school failure, poor mental health, impaired memory, problems with family relationships and friendships, and increased risky behavior. This chart shows that students most between 15 and 17 years old were most were more likely to receive as an A's and B's in school if they had not consumed alcohol, used marijuana, used prescription drugs without, doc, without a doctor's prescription, or used heroin in the past 30 days of the of the students indicating that they did not use marijuana in the past 30 days, 82% earned A's and B's compared to 63% who it indicated that they had used marijuana in the past 30 days. Oh. 
for our policy for our policy analysis section we examined a chart from the monitoring the future survey conducted by the university of michigan the chart shows a dangerous trend in marijuana use among 12th graders in the united states marijuana use among what use among 12th graders in the, in the united states Marijuana use among 12th graders was rising in 2013 while their perception of risks associated with marijuana use was declining. As more states such as Virginia make, make personal marijuana use legal, more kids will believe that marijuana use is less dangerous than it actually is. This is important because of the negative impact marijuana use has on health and well-being of young people. The American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, envisages the importance of examining racial bias and the enforcement of marijuana laws, specifically against Black and Latinx populations. In the 2020 report titled, A Tale of Two Countries Racially Targeted, Arrest in the Area of Marijuana Reform, the ACLU details marijuana arrests from 2010 to 2018 and examines racial dispar disparities at the national, state, and county levels. These two tries treat Latinx as an ethnicity rather than a distinct racial group. Latinx individuals are incorporated into both white and black arrest frames. The substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration conducts national annual surveys of marijuana use over respondents' lifetime over the past year and over the past month. The chart on the left examines the usage of marijuana for individuals 12 years old and over. The survey data finds that rates of use between Black and white populations do not significantly differ, but there are wide racial disparities and marijuana possession arrest rates between black and white people as can be seen in the chart on the right. In Virginia, black residents are 3.4 times more likely to be arrested by police for cannabis possession than white residents. Black residents are also nearly four times more likely to be convicted than white residents even though cannabis use is similar among both groups. Around 50% of people found in possession of marijuana in Virginia between July 1st, 2020 and January 11th, 2020. Uh, we are holding the bell for a moment. So please do not move until I come across either the intercom or the phone. Do not move until I come across the intercom or the phone. Remain in place. In January 11th, 2021, we're African-American, yet only about 20% of the state's population is Black. We learned that there are large disparities nationwide and in Virginia between arrest rates of black and white for marijuana possession. Even though black and whites use marijuana at similar rates, black, particularly those under 18 years old are being unfairly penalized and criminalized. Some penalties are important to make sure people behave, but there should be limits when penalties are harsh, unfair, and discriminatory. There is, this is a serious concern when minors and are criminalized for marijuana use or possession. In our class discussion, Nasia made a point that young people aren't really harming others, they're harming themselves. She felt like the punishments for young people should be lighter like they are for individuals over 18 years old. Our recommendations are, one, instead of criminalizing minors, give youth the support they need to become productive citizens in society, like intervention, counseling, and education. Instead of punishments, try treatment and diversion programs. Two, the Virginia, the Virginia General Assembly should coordinate 
and fund a statewide media campaign targeted at preventing youth marijuana use. Three, regulations should be enacted to monitor marijuana products, packaging, and labeling. Four, direct the marijuana regulatory bodies to establish regulation, restriction, cannabis, advertising, and promotion to ensure the safety of minors. Young people like us have dreams and goals of making contributions to our community and society. We do not want our dreams and lives derailed by marijuana use and possession or by unfair, harsh, and discriminatory cannabis laws and penalties. Thank you for listening to our capstone project on the legalization of marijuana in Virginia and the reduction of penalties for cannabis-related offenses among minors. This concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Up next, we have John Conroy. All right. Hello, everyone. So um, thank you so much uh, for having us here. Um, my name is John Conroy. I teach uh, Real Richmond and Government over at George With High School. And I have uh, the amazing Demario Lonzer here to just uh, talk about his project, The Hidden Beauty of Richmond, Virginia. And so I'm gonna be quiet and hand everything over to him. So just one second. Uh, is it muted? Unmuted. Uh, hi, my name is Demario Pinto Alonzo. I um, I've been uh, I'm a senior here at George Wolf High School, and today I will be presenting my presentation, the hidden the hidden beauty of Richmond. It took me a uh, a while to figure out what I wanted to do, but um, I decided on doing this, and I really I really do like it, and I hope you like it as well. So, um, without further ado. Without further ado, we can begin. Um, the problem that I wanted to um, solve, I believe that the people in Richmond don't appreciate the beauty of the city as they should in their action, by their actions and the way they treat the city. My goal with this presentation is to show people what we don't take care of in the city. Of the city. It could lose its, if we don't take care of the city, we could lose its beauty, I'm sorry. Um, uh, how do I do my slides? Um, the city, um, parts of, um, the city is also breathtaking everywhere I go. I see things that look amazing to the ground, to the buildings. This, um, the city can be truly um, a spectacle at night or um, in the daytime. So these pictures I provided myself, I, I went around Richmond like every day of my life, just taking pictures, just appreciating what I'm, what I'm seeing. So um, this was, um, this was around, I think like, Jackson Ward. Um, it was one of the bus stops I used to take um, to the city. So, so I took. I always take pictures because I I like to do photography. So that was part of the reason why I also wanted to do this presenta um, presentation to show everyone how even in night or day this the city can be truly spectacular. Um, um, the historical landmarks. If you ever wanted to learn more about the city and wanted to see its beautiful, um, to see beautiful sites, there are plenty. There are many places in Richmond you can go to, like the American Civil War, the American Civil War Museum, the um, Holocaust Museum. Those are really nice places to learn more history and to learn more um, the, um, how they were built in Richmond. Um, like, like even my um, dentist office, office has um, history too, like old pictures of what it, what, it, what it looked like before then, back around the um, 1900s. And um, the Mackie L. Walker National Historic Site. Um, I, I used to walk by there like most of the time. I couldn't really get a picture of it because I couldn't find it in my, in, my, in my old gallery, but yeah, it, it, it's truly a, a place to appreciate. There are plenty of cultural points of interest in every um, part of Richmond. There are places that, um, surround different, that are surrounded by different cultures that have amazing people in them, like um, Jackson Ward. I see, a many, I see many amazing people in Jackson Ward. Like um, there's, just, um, there's just one guy that um, 
sells food there. He just likes talking to people. He likes appreciating it. Um, I, love, I like talking to him too. There's um, there's a good barbershop there. There's um, there's a nice little store there. We can get food um food from different places. So I really appreciate it there too. Um, and you can just take a break and relax um, in Richmond. Everywhere through Richmond there are places you can just relax and truly understand the comments of places in the city. There's like, there's plenty of parks. There's one park specifically I like to go with my family where we just pet the animals. I forgot, I can't, I can't quite recall the name of it. Like there's buffaloes, there's eagles you can, you can go see. My little sister loves it there. And sometimes I like to go to the park too and just, and just lie down and take a breather and just appreciate what, I, what I've been given, you know? And I like to look up in the sky and just take pictures. And Richmond, well, even when I'm go even when I go to college this um, year, uh, many of this place, many of these places will be different. But I can't always appreciate that the city is going to keep growing more with more people, more and more people coming into the city. I see the more I see it grow, I see it grow. I've lived in the city all my life, and the more things, the more the more things I see, the more they change. And that's a, and sometimes change is good. It's okay to adapt. That's why the city. That's why I love the city so much. It adapts. It is that it keeps growing from from one from one small place to another and you can see it it's truly amazing but there is still a big issue with this city even though there are great things in the city i feel that it's getting hard to recognize this beauty day by day that so makes it makes me feel like i like people don't really care about the city and it's because of this big problem The constant and like the huge amounts of trash I see everywhere I go, I see constant pile up in the city near our schools, near the highway, near the Richmond City Raceway, near our libraries. I um even in my own yard, I wake up and like sometimes I clean up my yard. I when I'm moving on, like the next day I see trash. I see I saw people even put trash in my yard one time. And like it's like people don't it, it's like an endless cycle. I just keep seeing it over and over again and it gets and it gets annoying. But I do believe the city, just like I said, the city can adapt, it can change. And we can, if we all work together, we can just change the city into a beautiful place where it can thrive, where it can keep growing like 20, 30, 50 years from now, like when I'm old and, when I'm old and gray. And I just see so many people getting along on um, appreciating one another in the city because Richmond, Richmond is, is, Richmond is hard. It's, it's, you can appreciate it. It's, it's just like we're a place where everyone can come together and truly understand what it means to be part of a growing society. Uh, that's my presentation. I hope you all appreciate it. I have to, um, I'd like to thank my teacher, Mr. Conroy, for putting me to this project. Um, he's been helping me making sure I go to high, I graduate, making sure I, I got accepted into my college. Without him, I don't think I'd be here, like talking to you guys. So I really, I'd re um, I really appreciate it if you gave him a, a little praise, you know, just uh, help my teacher. He's a he's a really good guy. He tries his best, and I know it's hard. It's hard. This this school we don't really like tell him much about everything, but he tries to make sure he tries to connect with his students, and I really appreciate that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Carlos. So thank you so much. Uh, I have Carlos here ready to present his uh, project on the food deserts in Richmond. So just give him one second to jump on the screen. Okay. Hey. Okay. Uh, my, my name is Carlos Rosales, and this is my real Richmond project, Crapstone. Uh, the, my main problem about um, what's my um, project about is about food deserts. Um, what, what would be food deserts called? They are defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as areas where people cannot access food affordably or nutritious. It could be many reasons like the lack of grocery stores, markets, or even healthy food providers. But 
why should we consider about food deserts? The lack of nutrition, food, and easy access to food may be linked to many diseases like uh, high in sugar, sodium, and unhealthy fats. This could be considered related to conditions such as high blood pressure and cataracts disease. Um, some reasons for food desert. They could be of low income, no access to vehicle, for proximity to a store, and many um, migrant communities, like uh, Hispanic and black communities. Um, some of the food effects of food deserts, people would really rely on fast food areas instead of like going to um, a fresh supermarket among like with low um, income communities has, has prudent nutrition and really healthy, um, not healthy upset really. Like um, a cycle will be continue happening if if people aren't are still are buying from convenience stores, which are really expensive. They have low nutritional value, but further limiting people capacity to buy food. Have you ever noticed that Richmond had mainly fast food areas instead of grocery stores? Like here, where I took a screenshot of Southside Plaza, it legit like just five minutes from drive from here, from George Wood High School. Right here, you see a save a lot, while mainly like six uh, fast food restaurants, like here you see Subway, all these restaurants right here, the orange slots. But you only see like two supermarkets there, while the rest are just uh, stores or convenience stores. Point. These are what I was talking about. The orange dots were fast food and red were grocery stores or convenience stores. There are many communities who live close to areas where there's no supermarkets a way to get attainable food. And like where the indicate orange is, it's really with not that much areas where you can get food. But in green, you can um, have easier access to food. Well, like southern parts of um, southern Richmond, you can see a lot of orange where a lot of many people live, so they really don't have access to food. And that'll be, that's all my And that'll be all. That's all my research I did using um, fast food as my main topic. Thank you very much, Carlos. Mm -hmm. Mr. Carver, I'm done. Next up, we have Dr. Mylandra Coleman. Good morning. My name is Mylandra Coleman, and I'm a teacher at John Marshall High School. I have had the privilege of working with seven phenomenal juniors during our Policy Pathways semester. I am about to turn it over to them and I hope that you will enjoy their presentation. Our first speaker is Ms. Heaven Smith. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Heaven Smith. I'm in 11th grade. Our capstone project is titled Policy Throughout the Life of Arthur Ashe, Historical and Contemporary Analysis of Racially Discriminatory Politicies in the U.S. Athletics. Our capstone site is the Arthur Ashe Oral History Report, the Arthur Ashe Legacy Fund at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, in partnership with Virginia Interscholastic Association or Heritage Association. Chinere Nguonwe is a capstone <laughs> is a capstone site representative. The other members of our capstone team are Chimani Brown, Luis Carabello, Anthony Kill, Dontrell T Jones Teal, myself, and Aaliyah Williams. There are students, at, we are students at John Marshall High School where Dr. Coleman is our teacher. The problem statement for our capstone project is Black tennis players have faced and continue to face racial discrimination 
which may contribute to mental health challenges. Before Arthur Ashe, there was a tennis star, Athea Gibson, a 2021 article titled The Legacies of Tennis Champion Althea Gibson. Arthur Ashe and the Williams sisters show the persistence of American, America's race obstacles by Destin and Dyer tells the story of Althea Gibson, who was first Af who was the first African American tennis oh, sorry, the tennis star male or female to break the color barrier in almost all white, highly privileged professional tennis world. Gibson was born in 1927 in South Carolina to a sharecropper family. Her family moved to Harlem where she began playing tennis competitively as a teenager at the Black American Tennis Association. Gibson had to fight just to be allowed to play in the United States National Championship. In 1950, ooh, sorry. In 1950, Gibson became the first Black African, ooh, American to play the major all-white tennis event at Forest Hill in Queens, New York. She was constantly bombarded with the N-word from racist spectators. Some shouted, beat the N-word. She eventually became the first Black person to win the French Championship, today's French Open, in 1956 and 1957. She won Wimbledon in United States National, today US Open Championships. Gibson was voted Female Athlete of the Year by Associated, Associated Press in 1957 and 1958. To begin our presentation, we'll talk about the historical and contemporary policy context affecting, affecting Black athletes and sports. For our historical context, we'll look at the history of segregation in tennis in Richmond where Arthur Ashe was a young boy. Arthur Ashe was born in 1943 and raised in Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy. Richmond enforced racial segregation in housing, medical care, education, employment, transportation, and public parks and recreation. Blacks had to be cautious of the symbols of racist se segregation, including streets that divided communities and whites only and color only signs. It was this environment that Ash grew up in as a skinny 12 year old. He recalled the day when he and his coach were turned away from, ten from a tennis tournament held at one of Richmond's white only parks. Ash recalling his disappointment yet newfound determination to break the color line. He walked away knowing that on the only reason he could not play was because he was black. Ash faced other um, other incidents of legalized racism, like when he rode public transportation and the white driver asked him to move behind the white line on the bus. No matter his tennis achievement or grades, he could not enroll at the University of Virginia, the United States founded by Thomas Jefferson because, because of the color of his skin. Brookfield Park was the largest public space for African Americans in Richmond City during the segregation era. It was one of the few parks that Black people could use. As a child, Arthur I spent a lot of time a lot of time at Brookfield Park because of his father worked at the park. Ron Charity introduced Arthur Ashe to tennis at Brookfield Park. Brookfield Park had four tennis courts. They were the only ones in Richmond available to Ash. Due to segregation, it was where he learned to play tennis. Ron Charity described by the Richmond Tennis Association as one of the best black players in the country became Arthur, became Ash's first mentor. Charity drove Ash to Lynchburg to a tennis camp organized by Dr. Robert Walter Johnson. Johnson was called the godfather of black tennis. Johnson had coach Athea Gibson. Hi, my name is Aaliyah. In the 1950s and the 1960s, Bird Park was a white only public park in Richmond. We listened to an oral history interview with Tom Truman, a childhood friend of Ashes. Mr. Truman for many years didn't know who Arthur Ash was because Ash wasn't able to play at Bird Park and tournaments in Richmond. Bird Park hosted youth tournaments, but Ash was often turned away as turned away as the public tennis courts were restricted to whites only. Ash never got a chance to play at Bird Park as a child, but he returned in 1968 as a part of the Davis Cup team. We also learned from an old history interview, Lucius Edwards, a former black youth athlete in Virginia, that because black schools in Virginia were often received less money for sports facilities and programs than white schools, 
Programs like Virginia Interscholastic Association were created to give Black students more opportunities. To understand the history of racial discrimination more, we learn about history of the Country Club of Virginia. The Country Club of Virginia is a private country club in Richmond. When Arthur Ashe was growing up, CCV was one of the tennis facilities that was reserved for whites. Every year, Arthur Ashe's first coach, Ron Charity, applied to participate in the City of Richmond tournament at the CCV and was never accepted. Though CCV officials have said there were no policy restrictions on African-American. It wasn't until 1992 that a Black physician, John Edward Kane, and his family became the first Black members. Ultimately, despite the limited opportunities Arthur Ashe had, he became a successful tennis player winning the U.S. Open in 1968 and Wimbledon in 1975. Motivated by his life experience, Ashe used his voice to speak up for others, including human rights, Black South Africans, and Haitian refugees, health inequalities for African Americans, and HIV AIDS awareness. Today, there are more opportunities for Black tennis players. However, for our public policy topic, we will have to understand how, how have the issues affecting Black tennis players today changed and how can policy help? Today, some Black athletes continue to experience blatant racial discrimination. Despite racism, Williams' sisters remain dominant in tennis. Athea Gibson serves as a role model for Serena and Venus Williams. Just as Gibson overcame obstacles to attain the highest recognition in the tennis world, so have the Venus and Serena Williams. The Williams sisters began to play tennis at a very young age in Compton, California. Their father, Richard, was, was their coach. Since, late, since the late 1990s, they have dominated women's tennis. Venus has won seven single Grand Slam titles and Serena's 721 single titles. On, one, on more than one occasion, Serena has been ridiculed in sexist terms in print and social media of, for her powerful body image. Being 5'9 and 150 pounds, stereotypes play in the economics of tennis. In 2015, Serena Williams had $13 million in endorsement, and Maria Shapova, who has lost to Serena Williams, had $23, $23 million in endorsement. Prejudice about Serena's body types appear to be a factor. Maria Shapova is thin, blonde, and white. Serena Williams is muscular, curvier, and black. America's racial legacy unfortunately continues to impact on the next generation of aspiring black tennis players. It is important to note that the challenge Gibson, Ash, and the Williams sisters have endured reflect systematic racial barriers that continue to shape the participation of young black players in tennis. In 2013, United States Tennis Association conducted its first nationwide study of the educational, behavioral, and health benefits of adolescent tennis participants. The study found that Black and Hispanics were underrepresented amongst tennis participants. Naomi Osaka is a Japanese professional tennis player who has been ranked number one by the Women's Tennis Association. She is the first Asian player to hold the top ranking in singles. Her mother is Japanese and her father is Haitian. After the US Open in 2021, Naomi Osaka said, I feel like I'm kind of at the point where I'm trying to figure out what I want to do. And I honestly don't know when I'm going to play my next tennis match. Sorry, I think I'm going to take a break for, from tennis for a while. Similar to Arthur Ashe, Naomi Osaka also used her voice to speak up on racial injustice in public health. Along with several other young Black athletes, Naomi put a spotlight on mental health when she made this announcement and prioritized her mental well-being by withdrawing from the 2021 French Open. Research reveals that 33% of college students report struggles with mental health, while 30% of students experience mental health challenges seek mental health services. Only 10% of student athletes do so. In 2020, the NCAA hosted a summit on the mental health concerns relating to athletes of color. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, NCAA, surveyed their student athletes in 2020. Among black student athletes, nearly one in three male athletes 
and one in two female athletes reported sleeping difficulties during the COVID-19 pandemic. Of male student athletes, 40% of Latino student athletes and 30% of black student athletes have experienced sleep difficulties during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's higher than the 28% of white student athletes who had sleep difficulties. Also, they ask students about anxiety. Of male student athletes, 17% of black student athletes and 15% of Latino student athletes reported feeling overwhelming anxiety compared to 13% of white student athletes. Of the women student athletes, 20% of the black and Latino student athletes experienced feelings of hopelessness compared to 15% of white student athletes. For feelings of depression, 14% of black female student athletes and 13% of female of Latino female student athletes experienced by experience these feelings by comparison. 8% of white female student athletes reported depression. These results seems to show that black, black and Latino student athletes have experienced more mental health issues during the pandemic than white student athletes. Researchers interviewed nine black male football players and NCAA schools to identify issues affecting mental health among black male athletes. They had several key findings and we'll highlight three. The first issue of affecting mental health amongst black male student athletes was stigma. Some athletes fear people, including their coaches, will think less of them if they admit struggling with mental health. Another issue was toughness. Students felt because, because people who believe men must always be strong, it makes it difficult to ask for help. Lastly, silence was another issue because mental health is rarely discussed by coaches or teammates, there's no space to talk about. Now that we've shown how mental health is an issue affecting Black and Latino student athletes, we'll make our final policy recommendations. Colleges and universities should make sure Black and Latino students feel more accepted on campus. They should make sure these athletes know they are a part of the campus community. Athletic departments should encourage student, student athletes to seek mental health service, services before they start struggling with mental health challenges. Finally, students, finally, schools and athletic departments should encourage self-care. We learned a lot about what top tennis players have gone through to succeed. Gibson, Ash, the Williams sisters, Naomi, and Coco are our role models. We learned about their discipline, focus, drive, and determination to excel no matter the obstacles. Thank you for listening to our capstone project on policy through the life of Arthur Ashe, historical and con contemporary analysis of racially discriminatory policy in U.S. athletics. We hope that you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Mr. Chad Ingle. Hello, everybody. First, I'll say great job, everybody, so far. Richmond Public Schools is really awesome. My name is Chad Ingle. I teach um, AP US History, AP World History, and most importantly, Real Richmond at Open High School. And so, um, you know, we love Real Richmond here at Open High School, right in the middle of the city. We've had an opportunity to get out in the city. We've had an opportunity to take critical research techniques and use them towards learning more about the history and culture of Richmond. And, you know, at Open, we know that we allow students to see themselves in the past, their position in the present. Am I muted? Can you hear me? Our, our position in the present will become more secure. And then students can see that their position in the future is also more clear. And so today we have a student scholar, Marcus, who won the award for Realist Richmonder here at Open. And she is going to tell us about LGBTQ plus history in the city of Richmond. So I'll turn it over to Tyler. Uh, hi, my name is Skylar Marcus. I'm a junior at Open High School, and um, my capstone project is about LGBTQ history in Richmond. Um, so my project, uh, the medium I chose to present my research was a museum ex exhibition where I uh, put all my information into uh, posters and printed out pictures and wrote descriptions of the people and the organizations that I researched. Uh, my inspiration, or why I wanted to do this project is because I think that LGBTQ history is something that is important to learn about, and I wanted to learn about how the city I live in became a generally supportive place for LGBTQ people. 
as someone who is part of the LGBTQ community and someone who has lived and has grown up in Richmond, um, I think that's important that I learn about the history of the LGBTQ community, especially in relation to the city that I live in. Uh, so here's um, one of an example of one of my posters for my museum exhibition that I created. Um, I created the exhibition in six parts and each with like a theme that I wanted to cover over the course of LGBTQ history in Richmond. And so for the first poster, I focused on like early records of LGBTQ history in Richmond, as many like LGBTQ people were still sort of hiding and not really out yet. And so that's what this um, poster focuses on. And um, the, the second poster, um, the second poster focuses on um, how LGBTQ people were beginning to come out and become more visible. And that's sort of what this one is about. It's um, some early like revolution type stuff and early protests, uh, fighting for rights early. And then um, my third poster focused on how LGBT people have become more outspoken about wanting rights and disability. And so an example of this one talks about the protests that went on in Richmond and um, places that um, wanted to help LGBT people become more visible and more equal. And so that's what my third poster was about. And my fourth poster was um, similar to that. It's a lot and um, it was sort of developing more visibility and rights for LGBT people in Richmond and that's what this uh, poster was about. It was a bit similar to the other one, but yeah, it's just a continuation of that. And then my fifth poster focuses more on the community um, in Richmond. And I think I think that um, the community, LGBTQ community in Richmond is very strong. And like, um, I included a lot of like recent examples. So um, places that you can still visit today, like diversity thrifts and Richmond Triangle Players that are um, places that really help develop the community of people in return to identify as LGBTQ plus. And then my final poster um, focused on like more recent um, developments, uh, more recent institutions, organizations, and recent people that are still in living in Richmond today and making a difference in the community. And so, um, the next uh, slide has some examples of the um, people and organizations that I researched. Um, I wanted to find people and organizations that were important to the development of the community and um, LGBTQ rights and history, rather than just focusing on like people that lived in Richmond that happened to be gay that were sort of famous. And um, that's kind of what I wanted to focus on for the people that I chose to research about. And um, yeah, these are all people, people from Richmond and um, like places in Richmond that are important to the development of the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community in Richmond. And uh, yeah, and then here's the completed museum exhibition in the hallways at my school uh, where people can look at it and hopefully learn something that they haven't learned before about um, the history of LGBT community. And for my sources, I mainly used um, this book, Lesbian and Gay Richmond by Beth Marshak and Olive Slorch. But I also used like main pages of Side by Side, Nation Foundation, Black Pride RDA, Diversity Thrift. And um, I also used another archive called LGBT Thrift Simple Note in Virginia. But yeah, that's my project. Um, yeah, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Skylar. Next up, we have Ms. Caitlin Sitlarchik. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, everybody can hear me. We're good. Um, good, mo good morning. My name is Caitlin Sitlarchik. Um, I'm a history and government teacher here at Cunot High School. Uh, throughout this semester, students and I have explored and discovered policy and government through a series of projects that led us to our capstone. I cannot be more proud of this group of students for their hard work, tenacity, and commitment in this course. 
The future seems bright knowing this group will be leaders in the future. I now introduce the scholars of policy pathways here at UNI High School. Good morning. Welcome to the 2022 RPS Capstone Showcase, and thank you for your time. Our class at Huguenot High School has spent the semester exploring policy formation in the United States government. We have been tasked with exploring the Russia-Ukraine conflict and completing policy recommendations. Please allow me to present our Capstone Project, Special Military Operation World Tour, an analysis of the Russia-Ukraine conflict and possible solutions in collaboration with Nazira Bolotsky. Before any analysis and recommendations could be completed, we as a class were tasked with the creation of our problem statement. It is as follows. The Russian-Ukraine conflict is a war or special military operation that has currently broken out between Russia and Ukraine specifically, but involving the whole world. This conflict stems from the Cold War and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The conflict has caused food shortages, death, deconstruction of infrastructure, and a wide-scale refugee crisis for Ukraine, while also effectively cutting off those within the Russian borders from the rest of the world. Other countries are experiencing inflation and supply chain disruptions as a result of the conflict. The solution for this problem will not happen overnight. It will take compromise, collaboration, time, and understanding. We can trace this conflict back to the dissolution of the Soviet Union and Ukraine's look towards becoming more integrated with Western Europe and other NATO countries. This created tension between the two countries and their allies and has led to an ongoing conflict and the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian military. The people living within the Russian and Ukraine borders are greatly being affected by this conflict, as well as others all over the globe. While Russia, Ukraine, and the surrounding countries have the most to lose or gain in the conflict through globalization, every corner of the world is being affected. The list of problems created by this conflict is essentially endless, but let's focus on some major ones. The global community is experiencing inflation, supply chain crisis, and oil, oil and food supply shortages. Ukraines are facing threats to their lives through increased military operations in the area and having to leave their homes in search of refuge in other countries. The largest and most impactful issues created by this conflict is the threat of nuclear war. All of the aforementioned problems have garnered the attention of citizens and governments worldwide. Currently and historically, there have been many laws, programs, and proposals to deal with this conflict and conflicts like it in the past. We will be exploring a few, but it is, it is most important to note this list is limited. The Temporary Protection Directive, which allow Ukrainian refugees to move freely in the EU and the Unite for Ukraine program, has allowed for nonprofits and other Americans a chance to sponsor refugees provided they can financially. President Biden's plan wants to accept 100,000 refugees. President Biden has enacted the Lend-Lease Act as well, which has allowed the U.S. to provide military and financial aid to Ukraine and created a way for them to request aid. The World Food Program has been providing food assistance and cash su supplements to fleeing Ukrainians and other facing, others facing food insecurity. Governments around the world and private companies have created economic sanctions on Russia as well. If we are looking at what kinds of policies have been enact enacted when economic hardships has affected the entire world, historically, we can look to the New Deal and the War Powers Act. Our programmatic recommendation which we will you will hear soon about mimic policies like the new deal and requires the use of the war powers act like it has been used in the past during conflict as we work towards our programmatic recommendations we compile data and information to support our solutions to the problem when looking at the refugee crisis, we can see the projected refugee population by July of 2022 is over 6 million refugees from this conflict alone. While the data we have provided focuses mostly on EU countries, this data was collected in March and is based on estimations. As the situation evolves, the numbers will be adjusted. In terms of humanitarian crisis, the 6 million displaced people create the need for quick and decisive political action from, the, from around the world. The Ukraine Democracy Defend 
Lend Lease Act of 2022 was signed into action by President Joe Biden and this streamlines US military and financial assistance to Ukraine at close to $40 billion. Russia has been under economic sanctions for years now, but these have increased exponentially over the past few months. To keep Russia economically isolated and make conflict on their behalf difficult, Governments around the world have refused to do business with Russia. Their international bank accounts have had their assets frozen and private companies have pulled their products from Russian shelves. Because of their share in global markets, Russia, Ukraine, and the surrounding regions have seen a stall in certain food products such as barley, maize, sunflower products, and wheat. The area of the world also provides a large share of the world's oil and gas products. Because of the economic sanctions and the actual conflict, the supply of oil has gone down while the demand of an increasingly opening society post-COVID shutdowns has created skyrocketing prices and the ability for gas and oil companies to price gouge their products. Peace talks and negotiations continue throughout the the month of March, although unsuccessful in the end, they have provided an outline for the request for both sides for successful future talks and negotiations. As we continue to analyze the conflict itself and the policies surrounding it, we are going to look at the impacts of these policies and the impacts because of the lack of policy. Let's start with the impacts of the policies we highlighted earlier. The Temporary Protection Directive and Unite for Ukraine program have made refugees' ability to move freely within the EU much easier, while the Unite for Ukraine program removes strength from EU countries' responsibility for taking care of refugees from the conflict. The Lee Act for Ukraine with upwards of $40 billion in financial assistance and weapons aid and the law. We are and financial assistance. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. And financial assistance and weapons aid and allows them to hold their own in the conflict. The World Food Program has provided cash based transfers as well as food distributions for upwards of 5 million people affected by food insecurity because of the conflict. Contr countries and private companies around the world have placed economic sanctions on Russia. Russian oligarchs and the Russian government's access to their funds and their ability to easily move within the EU has effectively been cut off. While this has affected Russia's abilities in the conflict, Russia itself has been exports over the 200 products and blocked investors in China. Without, oh. Impacts of policy have been great. There have been plenty of impacts from the lack of policy. While there are large programs for refugees, there is a large there is a lack of support and rational programming for refugees, which can lead to social economic problems in the EU and around the world. The refugees from this crisis have created a surplus of labor and a need for redistribution of sources. Without financial aid and weapon aid, Ukraine does not stand a chance against Russia. So the Lend Lease Act and other financial aid programs must continue until the conflict ends. There have been massive food shortages around the world and price gouging on oil and gas because of supply and demand rates. Without government programs and regulations around the world, the issues will persist. Without aggressive peace talk, both sides will be bear an enormous human cost. As a class, we have created three possible policy recommendations to help relieve some of the stress of the conflict and hopefully lead to future solutions. We fully recognize these solutions will take a lot of work and compromise and a solution to this conflict will not happen overnight. We do believe, though, that our recommendations are valuable in the long term, provided government and citizen cooperation in the United States. Our first recommendation is the expansion of the Unite for Ukraine program. We believe the United States has a responsibility as a world leader to set an example. We should be accepting 500,000 to 1 million refugees in need from Ukraine. Surrounding countries that may 
see conflict in the future and those seeking asylum from Russia over the next two years. Job and home displacement will be secured through other programs created to lessen the impact of the Russia-Ukraine conflict and to provide livelihood for those displaced. Our second recommendation is to make sure economic sanction, sanctions on Russia are continued. Gas imports from Russia should continue to be banned and those phasing out of gas imports from Russia should continue the process. While this may cause initial impacts to inflation and gas prices, it will encourage companies to look towards options that are less reliant on gas and oil and in the long run can create jobs. Russia's central bank assets should continue to be frozen and continue U.S., EU, and U.K. sanctions on Ru Russian oligarchs. The United States should use the War Powers Act to create other opportunities for the 1,000 companies that have suspended trade to make other products available that we would otherwise be getting from Russia. Part of this plan should be to provide incentive payments for companies to hire, train, and recruit refugees from the conflict. Uh, we can't hear you. Oh, hold on one second. We're just having some technical difficulties. Okay. Hello? Yes. Okay, Our third and final recommendation is to create conditions and policies in which the United States can move their reliance on imports, specifically those that come from Russia and produce those in the United States. First, then we put additional inaction of the War Powers Act to boost production of eco-friendly products and cars to reduce reliance on oil and gas. Priority jobs and home placement should be given to refugees from the conflict. In the end, less reliance on oil and gas products and cars help issues surrounding the rise in gas prices created by inflation and price gouging from oil companies. It also has the added benefit of reducing environmental impact. Government stimulus incentives shall be given to boost productions of wheat to, to reduce reliance on wheat from Russia. The graph here shows how the United States wheat production has actually decreased as of May 2022. Sorry. Our policy recommendation our policy recommendation is to not only increase but surpass the 2021-2022 amounts. Priority job and home placement should be given to refugees from the conflict. This could increase the World Food Program Excess products could be used for sale and profit to pay back to pay stimulus back or used to support the refugee program. Peace talks under the UN auspices must continue. Fighting needs to end in negotiations about delivering humanitarian aid and repairing infrastructure damages. Negotiation around Crimea, the DNR, and the LNR should be discussed peacefully, although the solutions might take five to ten years. All military activities in Ukraine must stop to bring the bloodshed to an end. We want to thank you for attending and taking your time to listen to our presentation. We would like to thank Policies and Pathways, Dr. Lupani Lucas, Ms. Christian Kent, and Dr. Nazira Boleski for their continued support and our success in this course. We hope the conflict between Russia and Ukraine comes to a peaceful end sooner rather than later. And look forward to our ability to impact policies in the future based on the skills we learned in this course. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's give our students a hand. This was outstanding. Very good. We do have, before we have our final comments and concluding remarks but from Delegate Dolores McQuinn, uh, while the students will not take questions, they will take compliments. 
So if you would like to make a, com a comment, a remark, um, I see that Dr. Harris Muhammad has her hand up. Um, it's, it's, you have the floor. <laughs> you all were wonderful. I'm so proud of you. Oh my gosh. So since we can't answer questions, which is fine, um, I would like to have some follow up with you all, maybe during my town hall meeting, I'm going to possibly connect with Dr. Lucas. I think the entire city of Richmond needs to see your performance and you should be able to speak to the work more in depth, what you have done and your passion. So this is what I saw today. I saw future policymakers. I saw future attorneys. I saw future healthcare workers. I saw future educators. Um, even though that field doesn't pay a whole lot of money, I'm just saying, but it's about the passion. Um, I saw a lot of different things today, this morning, that I'm just very honored to have been a part of this. You all have had wonderful, wonderful teachers and leaders. And I just have to give a personal shout out, just a personal shout out to Open High School, because I believe Chad taught my daughter. And um, just so, look, I had to get the tissue. I had to get the facial tissue. I'm sorry. I, I'm just, you all are just awesome. And I'm so proud of you. And never let anyone tell you that you don't have, it, have what it takes to be successful. Remain connected to each other, even though you're in different high schools, you never know the space or the place that you're gonna be in together. So don't let the name of your high school separate you and your success together. We're one Richmond, we're one Richmond Public Schools. And so I'm just overwhelmed with joy just to see the magnificent work that you've done. And I know that was long-winded, but I'm so proud of you. My heart is full right now. And lastly, you all have created your first master thesis, right? This is what you've done. And so take this work. You, you really have. I see Dr. Coleman going, mm -mm -mm. we know, me, Dr. Lucas, Dr. Autumn Neighbors, Dr. Coleman, we know about that work. And so you've just started. You, this is your master thesis. Take it and expand it and complete your doctorate. You can do that. I'm so proud of you. Okay, one more time, wait a minute. Very good. And if you would like to make a comment, just um, raise your hand in the Zoom room. Next up, we have Ms. Chaneri and Wanye. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Lucas. I mean, to it, it, it's difficult to even put into words how overwhelmingly proud I am of all of you. Um, I had the opportunity to work with the students at John Marshall High School. And, you know, when you're a capstone representative, you see all of the work week by week that goes into building this project. And, and you guys have done such an incredible job. I just, I, I'm going to keep myself from becoming emotional, but, but I am just so inspired as a, um, as a current policy student in a master's program, I'm inspired by the work you guys are doing because um, if you guys are doing it, it, it shows that there's work for me to be, be doing as well. And so I am just really excited to see how this launches whatever it is that you guys are gonna be doing in the future for all of you. Um, and, and I just hope that you know to be proud of yourselves as well. So thank you, thank you for just allowing me to, to hear your presentations this morning. Dr. Neighbors, do you have any thoughts? I always have lots of thoughts. <laughs> um, what really, what really just brings me joy, and you know, I have to not reach for the tissues. Is is that this this showcase is not just 
you know, from people that will always love you and be proud of you because you're part of our RPS community. But just hearing the words um, from across our country of people that have been working with you and the impact you're having, not just on our city, which is important, our community, but the impact that you're having with your, your research um, across um, wh wherever this YouTube reaches. And so that is powerful. Um, and so, so incredibly proud of each of you and your work you're doing students. So thankful for our teachers, because I know they have been pushing and it has been a hard year and you all have had great outcomes. So super proud um, to be part of this. Thank you. Wonderful, Dr. Is, Mr. Is. And, and, and any other accolades you wanna throw in there. Um, I wanted to uh, just congratulate all the students on the work that was done, the teachers who work with the students. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not amazed at the work they do because I know they can do it, but I'm, I'm just always amazed at the fact that they continue year after year to, to do the work and to present to such a wide audience. And, um, you know, let me say for our real Richmond students, um, you know, they created their presentations and their research from scratch from the top of their mind. So there was no framework of what they had to do. And uh, we've got students in the real Richmond course who, um, you know, who speak uh, uh, multiple languages come from uh, all over the world and the city. And I just love to see all of the emphasis and focus on Richmond. And, uh, you know, especially the one uh, 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 that was talking about the beauty of our city and how we need to work to preserve it. Uh, I mean, I just think that it's so important for our young people to continue down this line to continue to work hard, to continue to study, to continue to work to solve problems. You are the future. And that's not just something that we just say is cliche. You, you literally are. Like, I'm going to be gone, and many of the people here are going to be gone, and you're going to be continuing the work. So be encouraged. And again, we love you. We love you as students of Richmond Public Schools. And reach out to us for anything that you need, me especially. Peace. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, if there are no additional comments, we will now have our closing remarks from the Honorable Dolores L. McQuinn. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Polani, and to Dr. Polani, the board members, teachers, students, gra slash graduates, and other guests who are assembled. Uh, I'm indeed uh, humbled and honored to uh, be with you this morning uh, and to take the time to recognize and highlight these awesome young people. Uh, I think, Dr. Polani, I don't want to be wrong, but is this our third year? This is uh, our second year. It's the second year. Okay. Um, but however, we have, uh, you know, this work and Dr. Polani, I just can't praise you enough for your vision and for your determination to make sure that this happened and we are able to take young people who may have not been introduced to uh, how to uh, 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 look, uh, I guess, establish policy and implement it. Um, you, have, you have done that along with board members and others. And we are so grateful again for your vision for policy pathway. But to our young people, as we spotlight you today and your outstanding work, you have completed uh, rigorous and credit bearing uh, courses uh, during this year. What, what a wonderful program, again, that you have been a part of uh, and that we have witnessed today. Um, Richmond Public School uh, virtual program has done a phenomenal job at, at highlighting the extraordinary work uh, that you have completed in Policy Pathway Real Richmond. Uh, from your first course, you were given the unique opportunity uh, to focus on local Richmond residents, historical and cultural events and, and organization, and is evidenced in your impressive capstone presentation uh, that we have seen uh, this, after, this morning. Um, history has a way of telling a story if you listen intensely, uh, and it will reward you with keys to the future. Uh, but there is more to history, and that is the policy. When 
I uh, was a part of uh, helping to the inaugural uh, activities for Policy Pathway. We talked a lot about history and we spoke a lot about policy. And it was clear that Dr. Lucas wanted to make certain that young people uh, were giving opportunities to better understand, again, policy. And this way, the, this program, Policy Pathway, is introducing young people to the many facets of our society and what's going on in our society and how they can bring about transformational change. Policy is an important field. Uh, and we need more students like you to engage in that kind of career. As you continue to learn and engage in the community and the world around you, you will see that policy is the heartbeat of progression. Um, I like to say that you must address policy to provide the solutions. You've already taken the first step, young people. And so we thank you for being in this space. We thank you for standing here and being committed and dedicated to, to helping to, I mean, to learn and then helping to, again, bring about transformational changes. Now to Richmond Public Schools. I served on the school board many, many, many moons ago as a Dr. Harris is doing now. And so there is a special place in my heart, no matter where I go for Richmond Public Schools, we have some of the brightest, brightest, smartest, most intelligent young people in the world in Richmond Public Schools. And I will say it wherever I go, that given the same opportunities and experience and exposure that others have across this world, our young people can do the same. And young people today, you have proven that premise. And so I thank you. I say to each of you, continue to be dedicated, continue to commit yourself to learn more, to find other uh, adults of people who have had certain experiences and to look at, to mentor you. Finally, um, there are many things, challenges and problems that we are faced with. And some of them are beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension. But I also know that those, those things are not insurmountable when we look at young people like you, because you can help bring about the resolution and solutions. And so I ask you to continue to look for solutions. Lastly, to Dr. Polani, again, Policy Pathway and the staff, board members, Richmond Public Schools, thank you for your continual commitment to raising and preparing the next generation of leaders. We are in good hands. And as we look and we close such a wonderful event, I say to our young people, stay safe, stay vigilant, and then have a wonderful summer and a wonderful life. We expect to hear great things from all of you and we wait in anticipation. God bless you and thank you again. Thank you so much, Delegate McQuinn, Mr. Masiahu Israel and I, we are in partnership together for this endeavor and we together Thank you. Have a blessed day, everybody. This concludes our program.